case history of a 60 year old gentleman uh, presenting presented with complaints of tingling sensation of both feet yes in limited to the soles which was in serious in onset continuous disturbing his sleep okay so the next uh, next uh, symptom was 10 years later okay Ten. no uh, sir so days. suppose this patient had come to you at that time suppose the patient had come to you at that time tingling sensation of both feet and disturbing the sleep so what do you think hmm. the anatomical substrate for that uh it be in the peripheral nerves correct so this is a symptom of a dysfunction of peripheral sensory fibers okay yes. yes so that means the initiating factor here is a sensory five sensory symptom that is the tingling sensation of both feet on the plantar aspect disturbing the sleep means that this is a patient having a irritative stage of peripheral sensory nerves see when the early disease when there is a irritation of the peripheral nerve positive symptom is a burning tingling paresthesia hyperesthesia negative symptom is loss of sensation that is advanced uh, disease of the peripheral nerve so okay at this point we think of okay the patient has peripheral sensory fibers in the irritative stage okay next what happened 10 days later 10 days later he developed walking difficulty in the form of difficulty in gripping footwear of the left foot the family members noted left foot drop with a high stepping gait at the same time so what is this due to walking difficulty gripping the footwear is it a patient is aware it, of it, that when the chappal slips yeah. off or is not aware patient is aware sir. so what does patient it mean patient is aware that sensory is intact it may be motor involvement so that means if the if the chappal slips off and is unaware that means there is a sensory deficit sensory involvement if the chappal slips off and as it is slipping away he is aware of it that means it is a motor deficit so the first part of the story was a sensory neuropathy the second part of the story is a motor neuropathy now you have given yes. uh, a point there left foot drop so what does that mean yeah what does that so it is as essentially asymmetrical like involvement of left side what an asymmetrical involvement sir of the no no what is what is the localization for foot drop foot drop is not due to peripheral neuropathy anybody in the yeah, chat foot. foot drop is not a symptom of a peripheral neuropathy unilateral foot drop that means it is a lateral involvement of the nerves palsy either it is a lateral popliteal palsy or it is a l5 root involvement because mm -hmm. here the first part of the story is a peripheral nerve involvement i take mm -hmm. this as a part of the peripheral nerve but now it is not symmetric polyneuropathy there is a component of mononeuropathy because foot drop is due to left lateral popliteal nerve palsy so the patient not only has symmetric poly symmetric distal neuropathy as well as has got a mononeuropathy You understand that's a very important yes, that it is not simple peripheral neuropathy even if he is a diabetic we cannot say that uh, it is just a peripheral neuropathy peripheral neuropathy plus mono neuropathy affecting the left lateral popliteal okay then but however he was able to walk without support but there was positivity in his movements okay that become positive in his movement because of the motor weakness on the one side yes. Yeah. Okay, right. Next, uh, after one month on April thirtieth, he found difficulty in getting up from sitting position, in, which is insidious in onset, and requires one person support to walk. He managed to place his both legs from bed to floor. Okay, so difficulty to get up from sitting position means what? But because he is not able to. it um, means that put, a, put his weight on his legs patient has a proximal muscle weakness you see peripheral neuropathy is on the periphery 
it is below the knee and below the elbow in the upper limbs the moment there is a weakness of the proximal muscles whether it is a shoulder or gluteal muscles there is no peripheral nerve there now it is a radiculopathy the roots are affected now you see how each paragraph is giving a different localization the first sentence was sensory neuropathy symmetric the second part of the story is a foot drop so there is a mono neuropathy now the third part of the story difficulty to get up from squatting is a proximal muscle weakness proximal muscle weakness can be due to muscle weakness or it can be due to motor roots because we are now talking about peripheral nerve in the history wise so muscle disease is very unlikely so now the disease has more gone more proximally affecting the radicals radiculopathy so now what is happening peripheral sensory neuropathy then mono neuropathy and now radiculopathy has started in okay okay next yeah after one month he he found difficulty even while getting up from bed and requires two person support to walk okay more motor weakness of the proximal muscles then this is more proximal muscles after one month he was admitted to a local hospital he received iv immunoglobulin 120 grams but there was only minimal improvement of the symptoms okay so they did some investigation or something anyway enough so, okay sessions then july oh god ha huh. then and after one month he developed tingling sensation of both hands however there was no weakness he was able to raise both upper limbs above the shoulders and was able to comb his hair so only sensory involvement of both hands okay. good so this shows the patient now has upper limb distal involvement but only positive sensory symptom that is in the form of tingling sensation yeah. as of now sensation since july 25 there is no motor weakness so the whole history started in march right march yeah. march yes sir so it took about 6 months yes sir march till the disease is progressing still the disease is progressing so now you see how the disease has yes, marched sir. peripheral sensory then mono neuropathy then proximal muscle weakness radiculopathy in the lower rib yes, and sir. now upper limb sensory mm. you see the march of events yeah. if you live like this if the disease yeah. progresses then you will have difficulty in the proximal muscles of the upper limb also muscles okay yeah right next okay there is a significant history of weight loss of uh, about 10 kg since one year but there is no weakness of the upper limbs no bowel or bladder disturbances no history of fever or gene symptoms no history of any cranial nerve dysfunction right so now in this uh, slide what is striking is the weight loss of 10 kg now what does that mean in relation to the peripheral neuropathy which we are talking about uh maybe a l- wasting sir pardon wasting wasting uh, i am sure you have examined uh, wasting uh, 10 kg of muscle yeah. wasting will not be there when elderly man comes uh, with lo- weight loss what activity. is your thinking when elderly man comes with weight loss what is your thinking process nutritional anybody in the chat also can answer please so suspicion is whether he has got a underlying cancer or such severe infections like tuberculosis malabsorption any of these thing causing the weight loss so now if we take the slow march of the peripheral neuropathy and radiculopathy the weight loss here after ruling out all the routine things we should also investigate for an underlying carcinoma you understand so any malignant yes. lesion underlying which is responsible for the progressive radicular neuropathy as well as the weight loss so that sentence of weight loss becomes valid after your preliminary investigations we don't straight away go for uh, cancer investigations but it should be kept in mind if once the preliminary investigations are okay next okay so past history no similar complaints in the past 
is a non case of type 2 diabetes mellitus in 50 since 15 years on tap clomipride and metformin non case of hypertension since 3 years on tap amlod amlod tell me certain there is a history of covid infection in august 2020 five days of treatment was given in the wards details not known history of uh, tremors since 40 years is static only while doing activity doesn't interferes with the daily activities like mixing food brushing combing hair etc okay so the striking part of the story is a 15 years history of diabetes so mm -hmm. as you know whenever a person comes with tingling numbness paresthesia lower limb upper limb we first think of a diabetes because that is the commonest disease in the community and so the commonest peripheral neuropathy is due to diabetes so now the question is whether it is a diabetes causing all this problem peripheral neuropathy mono neuropathy and proximal radiculopathy so that is the question we will have to answer while we are investigating covid infection do you think there is any link between august and uh, march 7 months gap no no sir it is too long a gap isn't it yeah. so usually it follows immediately or within 2 to 3 weeks now 7 months gap is extremely unlikely to be related to covid infection now there is another symptom which the patient has tremors what do you think what type of tremors is this from the history like what you have intentional said? tremors pardon intentional tremors loud loud intentional tremors intention tremor where do you get intention tremors parkinson's hmm intention tremor speaks of cerebellar disease so if the patient has intention tremor for 40 years how can he be walking normally till the present illness it is not intention tremor and you have already said somebody in the family also has got it isn't it yes, father you know when it comes to family history you know that this this is called as essential tremor okay all that essential tremor means is essentially tremor we have no specific name for the diagnosis like you say essential hypertension because it is nothing secondary to renal or such things we call it is essentially it is a hypertension and nothing more similarly long lasting tremors like this with a family history the diagnosis is essential tremors can it be parkinson's okay. tremor no no sir why there is no characteristic and it is static sir it's not increasing yeah 40 years uh, only is uh, parkinson tremor extremely unlikely and mm. there are set criteria for the diagnosis of parkinson tremor it is always mm. starting unilateral associated with rigidity bradykinesia postural imbalance and they remarkably improve with dopamine re replacement of l dopa and the 40 years and doesn't have anything else this is a classical benign essential tremor so that is something which he has been having grafted on that is diabetes and then hypertension and now peripheral and radicular neuropathy okay yeah. family history there is a similar tremor of the hands for his father treatment history includes uh, during covid treatment he has received oral steroids okay now you should have asked you should have asked some more details about the father's uh, at what age did he get it and what is his present status how disabling it is see remember even the benign essential tremor is very mild when it becomes very severe they cannot even drink a glass of water it becomes so severe so we can prognosticate whether this person's tremor also become that worse or it has just remained the same <clears throat> by taking history from the family member father at what age he got it and after how many years what is his status is he dependent for something to drink water eating or is able to manage himself without problem because that will tell us it is really a benign condition in this person also 
Okay. Okay. So whenever you take family history, please take a little more detail. Just don't say family history present. For example, okay. if the patient has got a muscular dystrophy with family history, you should ask that person at what age they got it, and after how many years he is still able or disabled, because that gives a rough idea about the prognosis in the given patient also. Okay. Sir. Okay. So general examination. The patient is uh, conscious, coherent, cooperative in supine position, oriented to time, place, and person. Um, there is no paleoectrus, cyanosis, clubbing, lymphadenopathy, or edema. Vitals: PP 130-80, heart rate 86, uh, respiratory rate 18 per minute. It's febrile. JVP is no not elevated. Another systemic examination is not conducted. Okay, so that means uh, the. general examination which you saw is nothing specific because the patient has a loss of weight maybe you should look for some evidence of malignancy something in the abdomen or something in the lymph glands so general examination did not reveal anything sinister nothing. in this patient no. nothing okay. nothing okay, next the neurological ex neurological examination in high mental functions are normal speech and cranial nerves are normal Right. Bottle examination. Which, uh, one minute. Which okay. cranial nerve is simultaneously involved whenever there is a peripheral motor neuropathy? Facial. <coughs> the commonest is the facial nerve. You are right. So it's very important to know in the cranial nerve examination. You should concentrate specifically on the facial nerve. For example, in patients with GB syndrome, when they come with quad paresis. when facial nerve is affected it is likely the patient may have further the swallowing muscles may be affected than respiratory muscles so it is an indication that the disease has progressed upwards okay sir okay <coughs> auto examination patient is in supine position upper limb and lower limb is extended bulk uh, showed significant wasting of the calf muscles on the left side so you <coughs> so you find a motor system examination hmm. the nutrition wise there is a wasting of the calf muscles on the left side it cannot hmm. be calf muscles you said patient has a foot drop isn't it yes sir foot drop is foot which drop. muscle is responsible for dorsiflexor tibialis anterior hmm somebody in the chat box also can answer please because this is a basic fundamental which is the yeah. muscle for dorsiflexion of the ankle is it tibialis anterior tibialis anterior sir <clears throat> so you should look for wasting of tibialis anterior specifically if calf muscle is wasted it is a plantar flexor which should be weak is the plantar flexor also weak that we will see in the power examination see with the moment you see a foot drop you should specifically look for tibialis anterior it is a wasting of the tibialis anterior which should be specific if the patient has plantar flexor and dorsiflexor both are completely 0 by 5 then it may be that even calf muscle is also wasted okay yes whenever you are examining you should be you are on the background and the background of yours you should keep on thinking okay Foot drop is there. That means tibial is anterior. So let me look at tibial is anterior specifically. Okay. Okay. Right. Okay. And uh, tone. There is hypotonia of both lower limbs, symmetric and uh, both proximal and distal. Hypotonia is a feature of what? Uh, lower motor neurons. Lower motor neuron paralysis. And what other conditions can give rise to hypotonia? uh the initial stage of upper motor neuron also during the acute paraplegia yes, acute, acute hemiplegia during that phase then what else then the muscle paralysis muscular Mus myopathies right myopathy. so hypotonia is not specific to lower motor neuron it can happen in upper motor neuron it can happen in lower motor neuron and it can also happen in muscle diseases 
upper motor neuron or at least somebody is uh, onto the chat box yeah upper motor neuron suppose the patient has an acute paraplegia shock stage what we call as the patient will have the hypotonia in uh, routine cases of hemiplegia which we see day in and day out if you find a hemiplegia has got a increased tone from the day 1 their prognosis for functional recovery is good but suppose the patient even after say 10 days the hemiplegic side is hypotonia their functional recovery is rather suspect so it's a very important point in hemiplegia patients to look for the tone of the muscles you understand okay okay sir right next power um come to the power both hip and knee compared to the right side left side is uh, 1 by 5 compared to the, uh, to the right side is 2 by 5 and angle plantar flexion dorsiflexion both right and left 1 by 5 so now it's possible that you have found only calf muscle wasting because plantar flexor also is wasted but according to you the wasting is only on the left side right yeah left side so, but uh, overall wasting is there sir over the bilateral lower so i think what you have missed is tbl is anterior wasting okay. when the patient comes back to you next time check okay. specifically for tbl is anterior because you are saying plantar flexor 1 by 5 both sides so in that case there should be wasting on both the sides but the fact yeah. that wasting is to the left side most often it is due to tbl is anterior wasting okay okay oh. and toe grip is weak both upper limbs are normal sir power right conclusion there is a significant motor weakness at the level of hip and knee left more than right and at the ankle equally involving both lower limbs right so now it is not a symmetric neuropathy it is a asymmetric neuropathy and a radiculopathy so let us discuss it further how to approach this patient Okay, next. Coordination not possible to elicit. There is there are no abnormal movements. What abnormal movements do you expect? Suppose you want to see some of the abnormal movements. Fasciculations. Fasciculation. Fasciculation is a sign of what? A uh, lower motor neuron. Hmm. Mot uh, that uh, anterior horn cell involvement. Fasciculation is a sign of degenerating. anterior horn cells or even motor roots or even motor component of the peripheral nerve perfect again fasciculation is a positive symptom when the yeah. anterior horn cell die completely then it leads to the wasting so in the early stages there is a positive symptom of fasciculation very commonly seen in anterior horn cell disease but it can also be seen in the motor nerve irritation in the motor root irritation the only with the only place where you see florid fasciculations that means you don't have to search for fasciculation it is there all the time is very characteristic of anterior horn cell disease okay, okay. but if you yes. see for example this patient do you if you see an occasional fasciculation it does not mean the patient has an anterior horn cell disease it only says yes patient has a motor root involvement patient has a motor peripheral nerve involvement so an occasional or infrequent fasciculation can be part of the radicular neuropathy okay right and uh, reflexes superficial reflexes in uh, the bilateral plantar so one flexors minute, all, of, all of you please remember they when the zoom goes away now first session i will come back at 6:45 for the second session so don't think that the talk is over so you will come back at 645 if they are closing at 640 we come at 645 if they are closing at 635 we'll come at because second session starts from 645 pm and the same thing the login details are all same this is my permanent uh, zoom login so any time any class any thursday even if you don't receive anything just login to the same uh, parameters yeah carry on yes uh, superficial reflexes bilateral plantar reflex of flexors and abdominal reflexes are present both sides deep tendon reflexes of the lower limb are absent sir 
which are the deep tendon reflexes of the lower limb you must mention that knee, knee jerk and uh, ankle jerk so uh, instead of saying dtr right there knee jerk and ankle jerk absent on both sides okay okay uh, come uh, sensory system superficial sensation touch with cotton is normal on pilot both lower limbs with pain pin prick is normal on both lower limbs so temperature pain and, and pain and touch is carried by what columns what tracts uh, la- lateral spinothalamus there is a name lateral column there is a name for it now what tracts are there pain touch hello hello spinothalamic ah, tract lateral spin uh, spinothalamic tract pain touch and temperature are carried touch. by spinothalamic fibers both in the lateral yeah. largely in the lateral sometimes also in the anterior so mm-hmm. here according to your examination pain and touch are intact but the temperature are reduced hot and cold yeah. you have checked it yeah, hot, hot and cold yeah yes sir yes sir checked and then comes the vibration vibration both lower limbs reduce sir left and right, right so vibration is carried by what tracks posterior column posterior column you see now the history wise we said tingling numbness paresthesia hmm is a spinothalamic problem but you did not hmm. find much in objectively but the patient hmm. has hot and cold impairment is again spinothalamic problem vibration is reduced so that is a posterior column fibers okay hmm. so that means yeah. in peripheral nerve all the modalities of uh, pain touch temperature and vibration position all these modalities are being affected a little more a little less but all are being affected right and come to gait patient requires support to get up and stand able to walk with a walker with the left foot drop and a okay. sensation and all so what does this mean go back support yeah. requires support to get up that means what yeah. proximal muscle weakness hmm you understand so yes, proximal muscle weakness is the one which is responsible for a person to get up from lower seat and once he is able to stand he is able to walk with walker now to yeah. walk if the knee has to be locked which is the muscle which locks the knee joint so that we can stand straight god uh, anybody in the chat please simple questions got to answer the questions which you will get in the viva voice to know to know how much you have understood the topic got to quadriceps quadriceps is the muscle which locks the knee so if a person has to be standing erect or just standing also the quadriceps is very important now you told me in the examination the quadriceps knee joint you said 2 by 5 right yes sir and at the same time he is able to walk with walker with the foot drop yeah. of course so that is slightly yes, contradictory so that yes, it was either, either your assessment of quadriceps is not really 2 by 5 must be more than more powerful than that or he is putting all his weight in the upper limbs and to the walker and lower limbs are just hanging so which you have to observe while he is walking understand the entire weight of the body yes, is sir. only on the so after exercise and while walking he doesn't keep the step properly and yeah. stand so that you have to see in the examination of the gait you have got a video hello yes sir uh, let us see the video yes sir yeah now look at it he is able to stand you see when he is shifting the weight from one leg to the other leg he is able to stand with the leg so that means quadriceps is functional to make him shift his body weight to the other leg so it cannot be really 2 by 5 you can show it once again you see that he lifts the left leg now the left foot he has kept on the floor now he has lifted the right leg that means the whole body weight is on the left leg at that time so if the quadriceps is so weak he would have buckled the commonest mm. symptom so, of quadriceps weakness is buckling at the knee 
suddenly they buckle <laughs> down that is a very important symptom of a quadriceps weakness okay i think 2 by 5 is so uh, this not right yeah so this was the uh, fifth day of the steroid treatment i examined on the first day so you think it is an improvement yeah sir definitely there was improvement no 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 when he was going he was was he buckling at the knee earlier which he is not doing is a question so you have to ask earlier he was not <coughs> earlier he was not working sir in the okay, at least so historically found him. at least historically <coughs> historically patient and the close relatives observe and say that he used to buckle at the knee and we were worried whether he will sit down because if the knee is not locked he will buckle but means he will fall yeah. to the ground sitting down yeah if you get that history then you can say look now he is able to bear the weight on one leg that means there is an improvement with whatever treatment yes yeah, okay. okay good actually Next there side. was like history here yeah. coming to diagnosis yeah uh neuro step on neuro deficit uh, one minute. Lower motor neuron one minute. you say uh, the important point a person who has got difficulty to go upstairs mm. so that is a gluteal weakness proximal muscle weakness gluteus a patient okay. who has difficulty to come down is a quadriceps mm. weakness because when the person is coming down the whole body weight will be on the knee joint that means the quadriceps okay. has to lock the knees otherwise he cannot okay. shift the body weight and come down by one step so if okay. patient has more difficulty going up the staircase is proximal muscle weakness the hip the gluteal group of muscle coming down is a quadriceps muscle understand okay, okay yes, now neuro deficit is lower motor neuron paraparesis involving symmetrically involved sensory impairment involving the temperature and vibration both lower limbs distally yes anatomical diagnosis polyradicular neuropathy motor involved more than sensory and pathological diagno diagnosis demyelinating or axonal involvement etiological diagnosis diabetes mellitus why did you say it is lmn paraparesis i i i am sure you know it but you will have to spell it out in the examination why do you say it is lmn paraparesis what are the points in favor of a lmn lesion because uh, there is weakness and both legs are hypotonic sir compared in See, uh, in a question like this when a question like this is asked in your mind you should run to the motor system examination nutrition yeah, tone power coordination abnormal movement reflexes so mm. each one when you think sir. you answer nutrition patient has got wasting tone yeah. hypotonia hypotonia power of power. Course, both um and lm and power will be low coordination not possible and yes. then comes the reflexes reflexes are absent reflexes are reflexes so, yeah you spell out why do you say element paralysis you say wasting hypotonia absent reflex okay so if you run through in your mind the standard format nutrition tone power coordination abnormal movements and reflexes whichever is positive in that you will have to tell okay now anatomical diagnosis what do you mean by polyradicular neuropathy where is the anatomical diagnosis Uh, because it is not not involving the spine level and uh, more multiple ne why, why neuropathy is involved why do you say it is a radiculopathy what is the evidence to say that the patient has a radiculopathy because proximal weakness is also Radical. there so more than proximal muscle weakness so it is a radiculopathy motor radiculopathy and why do you say there is a neuropathy because uh, yeah. the sensory involvement is also because the symptoms started peripherally and paresthesia yeah. tingling numbness which he had and the examination shows absent vibration sense which is absent vibration sense where sir in the ankle and the knee up to knee only checked if you are tested if you are tested over the medial malleolus don't say ankle yeah. 
B specific oh, TPs are proximal muscle weakness affecting the lower limb and then the distal muscles of the lower limb and then the proximal muscles of the upper limb. But this mononeuropathy, see, please remember the foot drop is due to mononeuropathy. So it is not only polyradiculoneuropathy, plus there is a mononeuropathy is there. So it doesn't fit in completely into CIDP, but it is one of the differential diagnosis. Okay. Somebody else has said hereditary motor neuropathy. Hereditary motor neuropathies don't start. What age is it? 65. Jay Shankar. Uh, yes, sir, 66. 66. Hereditary motor neuropathies, they are all coming in the younger age, pediatric and adolescent age group. Pediatric and adolescent age group. So question of hereditary motor neuropathy doesn't come into the picture at all. Okay. Now, so first diagnosis, you have made it as a diabetes. Now, pathological diagnosis, how does it matter for the prognosis between demyelinating and axonal? Suppose the nerve conduction says demyelinating more than axonal or nerve conduction says purely axonal. Does it have any bearing on the prognosis? Yes. Yes, if it is demyelinating, good prognosis. If it is axonal involvement is there, means prognosis will be bad. Yeah, for example, in CIDP and AIDP, it is largely demyelinating disease. See, myelin is covering the axon. Myelin is like wearing an apron. You know, you can take off the apron and get another apron. So when the myelin is gone, the nerve conduction becomes slow and there will be motor weakness. But myelin can regenerate. But the axon, the axon is the wire. In the electric wire, there is a wire inside which is conducting the electricity and there is a cover over that. So if the wire itself, axon itself is damaged, then that particular muscle fiber supplied by the axon is gone. But the function recovers because the surrounding axons will proliferate, the nerve fibers will proliferate and they function it properly. So in CIDP or AIDP, if you find there is a lot of axonopathy, the prognosis is slightly bad in the sense the recovery may not be complete. But if it is all demyelinating, then recovery is very good. So that is one reason why we do a nerve conduction study, not because we want to confirm there is a radiculoneuropathy, which we already confirmed clinically. So if it is CIDP, it will be predominant or exclusive demyelinating. And whatever be the label given for the diagnosis, demyelinating neuropathies have better prognosis for functional recovery. Okay, next slide. Okay. So coming to the investigations, uh, CBC, LFT and RFT is normal. Uh, they have done for uh, CA 1919 for carcinoma. It was slightly elevated. And the tumor markers CA and AFP was normal. Then so because all diabetes are done because of the tremendous loss of weight, which he has said, and a slightly yeah. uh, not a typical one, slightly atypical, whether it is CADP or other things, because there is a mononeuropathy, there is a radiculopathy, there is a neuropathy. Because of the loss of weight and that age of 65, even though there is a clear history of diabetes of 15 years. But mm. patient can have diabetes and can have a carcinoma. So to rule out mm. the associated cancer, because cancer also can give paraneoplastic syndrome of radiculoneuropathy. So that is why the investigation also done for evidence of underlying malignancy. Okay. 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 Sir. Next. And uh, HPMC was so well controlled diabetes. Okay. Yeah. Next. Nerve conduction study was done on April 5th. It showed uh, both lower limbs, sensory and motor axonopathy, both peroneal nerves motor absent and uh, left tibial nerve motor reduced amplitude and conduction velocity and right tibial nerve was normal. So what, what we have clinically described patient as sensory motor radiculoneuropathy is confirmed by the nerve conduction, nerve but conduction what, and also yeah. confirmed is the mononeuropathy. See, lateral popular is involved. So the mononeuropathy is also confirmed. But it is more of axonopathy, in which case the chances of total functional recovery becomes a little bit difficult. 
Okay. So the nerve conduction will only confirm what you have already thought of. So there is very limited yeah. uh, information you get from nerve conduction. For example, a patient who has diabetes and comes to you for hyperesthesia, paresthesia in the feet, and you examine patient as ankles are absent, not in touch is less. Doing a nerve conduction is a waste of money because you know the diagnosis, you know what is the problem. So always ask for an investigation which will add to the diagnosis and add to the prognosis. If, you're, if you think that clinical diagnosis of diabetic peripheral neuropathy, not in this patient, another patient, there's no need to immediately send for nerve conduction, which is a waste of money. Okay, next. Okay. CSF analysis was done on May 15th. It showed a cell count of two cells, a pro predominantly lymphocytes, and a CSF protein is elevated on 106 mg per deciliter. And CSF glucose is 133 milligram per deciliter, slightly elevated. And CSF chloride, 115. Actually, chloride has no value at all, but people keep on doing yeah. that. So here, the striking feature is the elevated protein level. So protein. what does that mean? Elevated protein level. Some inflammation. Demanding inflammation. Roots, root. Involvement of the root. The inflamed root. <clears throat> when there is inflammation. Okay. <clears throat> non-infective inflammation, for example, a demyelinating, like in CIDP, you find there is an increased protein. So the route which is passing from the spinal cord to the outside, it traverses through a CS of space. So when there is an inflammation of the radical at the origin, because of the inflammation, there is a leakage of protein into the CSF. So the CSF increased protein confirms that there is an active radiculopathy in this patient. There is an active, it is not a burnt out disease. There is an active radiculopathy. But it doesn't tell what is the cause of radiculopathy. It only confirms, like nerve conduction has confirmed. So the increased protein confirms the patient as a radiculopathy. Next. Then immunofixation panel was done on May 22nd. It revealed polyclonal profile in IgG, IgA, kappa and lambda light chains and negative for uh, monoclonal gamopathy. It's negative for monoclonal gamopathy. And protein electrophoresis was done, which showed uh, everything was normal at, at, apart from elevation beta to globulin fraction, which is not specific. So these are all, <coughs> these are all done for ruling out the hematological malignancies like plasma cytoma, multiple myeloma. So mm -hmm. those also can produce this type of polyradicular neuropathy. So the diagnosis has been opened up. It is not just diabetes. It can be due to underlying cancer or carcinoma or underlying hematological malignancies like multiple myeloma, plasma cytoma. So all these things have been done, but it looks that they are not really contributing. Okay, next. Yeah. MRI PET whole body scan was done on 23rd August, which showed only age-related cervical atrophy changes and interstitial T2 hyperintensities, which are not, it has reported as normal studies. Right. So, to rule out for one more test to be done for uh, ruling out the cancer part of it is a, whenever we think of a non-metastatic manifestation of an underlying carcinoma, we have got to do a PET scan either PET CT or PET MR to find out whether there's any uh, lesions seen somewhere. The biomarkers have been not very helpful. They are all within normal limits. So the imaging also is negative. So the search for an underlying cause has been negative. Uh, was the uh, ANA panel done? Autoimmune panel? Uh, no, sir, I think it done. was done. It was done. Nimna, Nimna, Nimna done it. Because the first, first, but, uh, uh, everything was negative, sir. That yeah, was first, uh, whatever you think, first, say autoimmune, then non metastatic, and look for a cancer structural lesion. So that is how we proceed. Next. So this is the PET scan, is shown normal. Okay. And so, nerve that biopsy was. Yeah, uh, biopsy was also done to roll out amyloid. Uh, on June 27th, it was reported as neurogenic atrophy, left tibialis anterior, 
and uh, the vessels and connective tissue include is negative for amyloid and skin biopsy is also negative for amyloid so they were looking also for an amyloid causing this amyloid. neuropathy so the nerve biopsy neurogenic atrophy i mean clinically we know it is a neurogenic and uh, the blood vessel and the connective tissue did not show any for anything suggestive of amyloid the amyloid stains no. were negative so also the skin biopsy okay so they were looking also for an amyloid causing this no. neuropathy so the nerve biopsy neurogenic atrophy i mean clinically we know it is a neurogenic and uh, the blood vessel and the connective tissue did not show any for anything suggestive of amyloid the amyloid stains no. were negative so also the skin biopsy okay have you finished yes sir can, so can i take over yes sir right okay now quickly i think we just have another 10 12 minutes now before i start uh, whoever has whoever has been attending uh, i am ready to take every thursday a class virtual class till the covid goes away then we move on to the uh, physical meeting on every wednesday at sagar so any one of you want to present a case please message me and uh, or message uh, uh, any one of our sagar res- residents sir jay shankar will be more than happy to have you here now peripheral nerve just quickly uh just got a myelin sheath and a nucleus and not terminal now this is an important slide you see they have got three types large myelinated small myelinated and unmyelinated large myelinated propio light touch proprioception and vibration and motor component so that's why whenever there is a radiculopathy large myelinated fibers are gone so large muscles are first affected in proximal muscle weakness first now small myelinated is touch pain temperature and autonomic fibers unmyelinated is the pain and temperature pain now important point here is when patient come with severe burning feet patient is a diabetic severe burning feet disturbing the sleep when you send the patient for nerve conduction there is no myelinated fiber there so the conduction will not be affected so you may get back the report that nerve conduction is normal so don't discard the diagnosis of sensory neuropathy so it's very important to know that nerve conduction is normal when the patient predominant symptom is only pain but whenever there is a proprioception is gone then it is a large myelinated fiber <clears throat> now the clinical features like any other part of nervous system suppose there is a irritation of the cortex you get a seizure once there is a destruction of the cortex you get paralysis so similarly sensory fibers tingling burning pain dysesthesia while tingling numbness numbness and pain can be at the spinal cord level or at the peripheral nerve level what distinguishes the peripheral nerve is a hyperesthesia and hyperalgesia when you touch with the cotton they say oh it's touching very badly or when you just touch with the pin very s- severe pain so uh, hyperesthesia and hyperalgesia is very typical symptom of peripheral nerve please remember that and in the posterior column band like sensation they'll say as though there is a toe ring if they get a feeling of a toe ring and then you also see the posterior column loss is there so that is a irritative stage of posterior column irritative stage of motor is cramps and fasciculations autonomic is heat intolerance so please remember hyperesthesia hyperalgesia is very typical of peripheral nerve band like sensation suppose in multiple sclerosis they come say that there is a band like sensation across the umbilicus it is a very typical of a posterior column involvement now at times there may be a difficulty to distinguish peripheral nerve from myelopathy when they come only for tingling and numbness so today the patient may come for tingling numbness of the feet the first diagnosis is peripheral nerve and after 15 days the patient comes with a spastic gait so they will say oh hu srinivas has missed the diagnosis but remember the disease evolves over a period of time 
So when you see a patient having a brisk reflex and tingling numbness peripherally, we know that it is a column involvement that is in the spinal cord. But as I told you, hyperalgesia, hyperesthesia is a very typical symptom of the peripheral nerve involvement. Now, this is very important. What is not peripheral neuropathy? This is for your clinical practice. Almost every day, I see one or two patients. They'll come and say, jum jum out of it. Don't stop there. Ask her to continue. So even yesterday, I saw one patient who had jum jum sensation in the feet. And then immediately, nerve conduction was asked. I mean, today only I saw a day later only. So I said, what else? Jum jum sensation here and some heaviness as though something is kept here and jum jum sensation here. Now, obviously, this is not peripheral neuropathy. Listen to the patient. Patient is giving you a diagnosis. Listen to the patient. Don't abruptly cut off. Oh, jum jum sensation is peripheral. Oh, you're diabetic. Achha, this is diabetic neuropathy. So when you find that the second point is if the jum jum sensation, tingling numbness is intermittent, so some days it is there, some days more, some days less, again it is an anxiety disorder. So a large number of patients with psychiatric symptoms of anxiety and depression complain of fleeting tingling numbness, tingling numbness beyond the peripheral nerve localization. So please remember this for your clinical practice. So there are varieties of uh, neuropathy which gives you a clue to a gateway to the proper diagnosis. Is it a mono neuropathy, motor neuropathy like that? Now another important clinical feature, painful neuropathy. Patients, you know that diabetic patients, they come with severe burning feet. They actually have to keep the feet in the water, in the cold water to get rid of that burning sensation or apply some cold cream and all that. Now, that is a severe burning pain, is a peripheral sensory neuropathy. It is a small fiber neuropathy. So, if the large fibers are not affected simultaneously, the nerve conduction will be normal. Once you see the presenting manifestation is painful neuropathy. So, that means it is a one of these differential diagnoses. You understand? Something has gone wrong. Okay, severe burning is a diabetic neuropathy. Okay. So sensory ataxia. If the patient comes with history of uh, uh, ataxia, which is causing the problem, then that means, again, it is a posterior column involvement, very typically diabetes, TBs, ataxiform. So what you have to do in practice is, what? okay, peripheral neuropathy is there, but what is the main problem for this patient? That's very important. What is the main problem for this patient? Is it a ataxia or is it a pain? So those are the things which will tell you a gateway to the diagnosis. Now, predominantly motor. Now, you know that this patient is predominantly motor. He has sensory symptoms, predominantly motor. So now you see, this is the differential diagnosis of predominantly motor. CIDP, lead, porphyria, Sarcomary tooth, hereditary, yes, but younger age group, not the elderly. And there is a condition called as multifocal motor neuropathy and some toxic ones also. So, whenever you see a patient who has bilateral symmetric peripheral neuropathy, it is a due to systemic disorder. Commonest is the diabetes. Whenever you see asymmetric neuropathy, obviously it is a local structural lesion. You understand? If suppose power goes off in my street, so it is something at the higher level. But if a power goes off only in my house and neighboring house is intact, that means there is something wrong in my house, electricity. So whenever you see a neuropathy lateralized or predominant on one side, don't think of a systemic cause even if the patient has a severe diabetes. Now in this patient, there is a mononeuropathy element is there. You can go back and see my peripheral neuropathy talk in the 
my HV Srinivas neurologist, if you go to YouTube, then you will find the uh, all these talks. This is the talk which I had given in the peripheral neuropathy slide. Now, another important point which will give you a clue is the thickening of the nerves. We all know that thickening of the nerves is commonest is Hansen's and fortunately the Hansen's has come down and diabetes does have hypertrophic nerves. Please remember thickening of the nerves is seen in diabetes also because of demyelination, remyelination, demyelination, remyelination. So the nerves do get and also in amyloidosis and hereditary sensory motor neuropathy. Now, should we do nerve conduction in every patient? I don't do it because I always think whether the investigation is adding to the diagnosis or adding to the prognosis. So, in a patient where there is a definite evidence of bilateral systemic, bilateral symmetric neuropathy and has diabetes, we don't have to do nerve conduction study at all because as I said, it may be even normal. But one most important, whenever you see a patient with wasting, whenever you see a patient with wasting of small muscles of hand, our first diagnosis is always anterior horn cell disease, pure motor involvement, wasting of the small muscles of the hand. And it may be bilateral also. Remember, there is one condition called as multifocal motor neuropathy with conduction block, which is eminently treatable conditions. Before we recognize this condition, we used to call everybody motor neuron disease. And surprisingly, we used to see that it was not spreading at all. It just remains at forearm and the small muscles of the hand characteristically. Then we say, oh, this anterior cell disease has not progressed, he is lucky. But actually, it is a multifocal motor neuropathy with conduction block. So here, a nerve conduction shows there is a conduction block. These patients are eminently treatable with IV IgG. So what are the limitations, which I have already told you about it? Always correlate, any investigation for that matter, always correlate with clinical features. Now, when do you do a nerve biopsy? Most of the neuropathies, when you do a nerve biopsy, it will show exonopathy or demyelinating, which we can get that information by nerve conduction itself. We don't have to do a traumatic investigation. So you don't do nerve biopsy unless you are thinking of a disease which can be confirmed by nerve biopsy. The commonest is the Hansen's disease. Then comes the vasculitic, vasculitic neuropathy. So these are the conditions where vasculitic neuropathy, leprosy, sarcoid, and amyloid neuropathy. So these are the conditions if you clinically suspect, please do it. Otherwise, most often it is only demyelinating or axonal degeneration that we already know by now conduction, there is no need to uh, do an invasive investigation. Which nerve to biopsy? Of course, you know that you, you biopsy a nerve without causing any damage to the patient. That means you don't biopsy a motor nerve and you don't biopsy a sensory nerve, which is important. So usually it is a sural nerve or a radial cutaneous nerve in the upper limb. If suppose the patient has only upper limb neuropathy, you have to do radial cutaneous nerve. If it is a lower limb and upper limb both, then you have to do the sural nerve. So these are all various nerve slides. This is just to show you the tuberculosis with the giant cells. Now in BT, you can see the lepromatous leprosy positive wound. After a long time, I saw a case of leprous neuropathy about two weeks ago. It is quite rare now. And of course, the patients were very worried whether it is infective to the wife and friends and other things. So now we have to tell them today leprosy has got a cure and the early stages of BT, TT and all can be totally cured by treatment. It is not communicative. It's a very important point we'll have to tell because they'll see all the photographs in the Google. So this is the sarcoid, the peripheral neuropathy, sural nerve biopsy showing the sarcoid granuloma. This is the, you see the necrotizing vasculitis. So perivascular inflammatory cells are there. So this is very characteristic of necrotizing vasculitis. Usually vasculitis uh, causing peripheral neuropathy occurs in a background of autoimmune disorders, ANA profile and all. Sometimes it can be exclusive primary peripheral nerve vasculitis, which can only be diagnosed by nerve biopsy 
and it is eminently treatable condition so please remember you do a nerve biopsy when you are thinking of a eminently treatable condition not just for the heck of it for for teaching institutions they may do it that is a different thing in spite of all the problems you will find that 20 to 25% there may be no etiology at all interestingly when you find that all investigations for bilateral symmetric neuropathies are negative not even diabetes then 25% we don't have like most of the uh, most of the medical condition we don't know the etiology of this somebody has made a study of these 25% 40% of them have a familial neuropathy how do you diagnose careful families nanage yarigadru adana hinge illa sir yarigu illa who is that yarigu illa one brother who is in america he has not seen him for the last 10 years another brother is dead and gone so he is the only fellow so don't take it family history negative so taking a family history is an art so unless you examine the all siblings for evidence of uh, electrophysiological neuropathy or a clinical neuropathy and important is you see the other telltale signs of a hereditary problem like hammer toes high arches weak ankles etc so in a teaching institution we look for all these things and then we produce a paper saying that don't just dismiss we don't know the cause of peripheral neuropathy if you go into a, all these conditions we call it as a familial neuropathy which is different from hereditary neuropathy hereditary neuropathy there is a genetic down, down down pull and so other person may be affected it is just happens to be in a particular family so this is an important point for you from theoretical point of view now if you go back what is this patient have so by process of exclusion of so many things we are back to the first diagnosis diabetic radicular neuropathy so the treatment please remember even in diabetic many diabetic patients come for proximal muscle weakness i give them iv methylprednisolone five injections pulse therapy and a fellow who could not get up from the seat now is able to get up with minimal support and able to walk so diabetic radiculopathy also there is a demyelination component and the steroids help usually physicians will say sir how do you give steroids in a patient who is already diabetic so my answer is can you not control a patient with 300 blood sugar 400 blood sugar you can and of course we are giving only pulse therapy we are not giving for oral prednisolone for two months so time and again this is a very important point for your clinical practice patients who come with proximal muscle weakness of recent onset in a diabetic patient give them steroids pulse therapy admit give iv methylprednisolone this patient for example he didn't improve with iv igg now he has improved with uh, steroids but he has come so late so it is unlikely that he will improve completely and steroids was thought of earlier but because he is a diabetic they said no no we can't give so please remember this in your clinical practice proximal muscle weakness of a recent onset in a diabetic patient pulse therapy now they are uh, that is a diagnosis now what we have got here if it is still some type of uh, uh, autoimmune variety we do not know so in such cases what we do is we give every month three doses of solumedrol that is methylprednisolone for consecutive three months and then maybe if necessary we repeat once in three months so remember this eminently treatable condition diabetic radiculopathy with proximal muscle weakness so if you look at the neurological manifestations of diabetes everything everything and anything is possible they come with uh, as you know sixth nerve third nerve seventh nerve commonest is distal symmetric sensory neuropathy some of them may have motor and sensory neuropathy small fiber neuropathy severe pain and paresthesia severe pain and hyperalgesia and autonomic neuropathy please remember it usually follows sensory motor neuropathy a patient who does not have sensory neuropathy or motor neuropathy if he has got a postural hypotension don't jump and say this is diabetic autonomic neuropathy again this is clinical practice in theory it is possible but as i keep saying 
common things commonly seen and that is the first so usually by the time they have autonomic symptoms of uh, bladder bowel sweating postural hypotension etc they would already have had enough number of years the sensory motor neuropathy mononeuropathy as this patient has got asymmetric proximal motor neuropathy possible motor rare so practically all types of peripheral nervous system disorder are seen in peripheral neuropathy so now the trend is if you know diabetes you know neurology earlier we used to say if you know syphilis you know neurology but now that syphilis is only historical interest the present problem is diabetes so if you know diabetes you know you very think about the peripheral nervous system now management again another important point in the management patients the moment they say jum jum sensation they immediately put on pre gaba jum jum sensation disturbing the patient then you give it you ask the next question how does jum jum sensation affect illa sir sumne irthada naan yavaglu yenu kelsa maadilla andre avaga nanage anustade does it disturb your sleep no it doesn't so this patient does not require any of these uh, gabaergic drugs severe pain the most important drug is amitriptyline not gabantin but because amitriptyline has side effects but in everybody don't get side effect so first choice is the amitriptyline and then comes the gabantin and then of course carbamazepine in that order but unless the underlying diabetes is well controlled all these are only symptomatic therapy please remember there is no medicine for numbness there is no medicine for decrease sensation because these are the negative points in the peripheral neuropathy so for the negative points there is nothing i can do positive only if there are positive points are there i can suppress it okay so we are going back to my usual thing saying that yes sir uh, yeah yeah so i have 18 talks of mine on the yes sir but uh, for everybody's information and there are 15 clinical case discussion i am going to upload even this clinical case because uh, the, he has presented jay shankar has presented it very well so this also will go into the youtube those of you who have not heard or who have not purchased please purchase clinical neurology made easy a very very primer very very important primer for your clinical practice and clinical understanding okay also there is a book written by me on epilepsy only those who are interested to know more about epilepsy can go there but this i think is a very important book for you it is av available on the amazon also not necessarily bookstores nobody has any questions on the chat box so i think we have less than 1 minute there so we'll meet next thursday and uh, we have the two groups made jay shankar has made two groups one dnb group another is the bmc group so any of you want to be included in bmc group or uh, uh, dnb group for information please contact jay shankar dnb resident in uh, sagar hospital okay